to start with just a short reading from the book and contextualize a little bit, and maybe we can draw on it more in, in Q&A. So what exactly is press freedom, and why does it matter? In the popular discourse of the United States, we don't ask this question very often or very deeply. The answers are obvious and almost cliched. The public has a right to know. Journalists are watchdogs. They afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Democracy dies in darkness, and voters need objective information to be good citizens. Popular histories of US journalism celebrate heroes who spoke truth to power and reformed institutions. People like Ida B. Wells, Nellie Bly, Edward R. Murrow, I.F. Stone, Woodward and Bernstein, Walter Cronkite. These people are remembered as most effective when they were left alone to pursue their visions of what they thought the public needed. If we just got out of the way of good journalists and let them tell truth to power, they'll produce the information that vibrant democracies need. And this myth is somewhat true. And these heroes were expert storytellers who challenged each era's norms. But when we think about press freedom only, or even mostly, as journalists' freedom from constraints, it becomes a narrow and almost magical phenomenon that depends on individuals and heroism. It says that journalists already know what the public needs. They just need freedom from the state, marketplaces, audiences, to pursue self-evident things like truth and the public interest. If journalists and publishers can get truth to the public, then readers and viewers will be able to make informed decisions about how to think, how to vote. Ultimately, the press wants to be left alone so that you can be left alone. That kind of democracy that dominates from this image of press freedom relies on a lot of independences, a lot of freedoms from. So the book tries to challenge this mythology. I try to complicate the idea of press freedom and show that it emerges not from individual heroes, but from social and technological, institutional, and normative forces that are all vying for power, the power to imagine publics to sort of implicitly fight for one version of democracy versus another. I see press freedom as a concept to think with, a hopefully generative and constructive tool for looking at any given era of the press or public life and asking, is this version of the press, of press freedom, giving us the kind of publics that we want or need? If not, how do we revise the institutional arrangements driving press freedom in the press and make something different that we would agree to call the press? Alternatively, how do we adjust our expectations about what publics can be, creating a different image of freedom than what might demand from the press? So if press freedom isn't about heroic isolations, but is about sort of a subtler system of separations and dependencies that make publics, Maybe we can see thinking about press freedom as evidence of thinking about publics. So uh, just to, to summarize in a way, I want to say that press freedom is simply this. It's the right and the responsibility to create separations and dependencies that help us govern ourselves. And it's the obligation to think critically about the kinds of publics that arise from those separations and dependencies. And I'll say a little bit more about what I mean by that. But today, these separations and dependencies, this stuff of press freedom, live in distributed technological infrastructures with new actors, new kinds of invisible forces that we haven't encountered before. So for the networked press to defend its autonomy, it must defend why it arranges people and machines in particular ways. It needs to understand how its humans and its non-humans align or clash creating some publics but not others. Press freedom in this sense is the freedom to create what we'll call, an academic would call a socio-technical relationships that make publics, this freedom to create relationships. So in the book, I try to deploy this framework and argue for a very particular value, and that's a public right to hear. I claim that the dominant image of press freedom as whatever journalists say they need to be free from to pursue this self-evident public interest that dominant image of press freedom privileges an individual right to speak over a public right to hear. It confuses journalists' freedom to publish with people's right to hear what they need to hear in order to sustain themselves as publics. 
And what I mean by public, it can mean a lot of different kinds of things. We want to keep that concept as, as flexible and fluid as possible. It could mean discovering sort of shared conditions of life that you can't escape from. Think about public goods that are inextractable. Our ability to debate similarities, differences, the conditions that we need for thriving, to devise solutions to shared problems, to protect ourselves from harm, to nurture good faith engagement and associations, and to ultimately think more broadly than the rational information models of citizenship that have sort of traditionally dominated thinking about the press and press freedom. So as we question today, I think our assumptions about communication, technology, information most broadly, we should also ask, how is the networked press, and I'd argue this is made up of journalists, software engineers, algorithms, relational databases, social media platforms, quantified audiences, user experience designs, immersive technologies. How is this collection of actors creating separations and dependencies that speak to this public right to hear? So the book goes through a lot of examples. There's a, there's a ton of examples of what I mean by this press freedom, how it's worked out in these infrastructures, these socio-technical relationships. But I'll just sketch a few um, within a class of examples that I call in the book resemblances. So these are moments when the press is trying to either to look like or unlike technology platforms. Moments when it's trying to get closer to or further away from platforms. So in the getting closer to sort of genre of example, a few examples. The Wall Street Journal created a Facebook-only app, and The Verge created its circuit breaker vertical within Facebook. Moments when it sequestered, both organizations sequestered news within those spaces, trying to get as close as possible to the platform. The New York Times and Guardian currently still do uh, pepper stories with, quote, tweetable phrases that have been tested well to drive social media traffic and engagement to do well on those platforms. A closeness in the writing for the platforms. Uh, NPR saw an uptick in its location-specific traffic when it used Facebook's system of geo-indexing to publish its stories and to reach particular audiences. NPR was rewarded for making its understanding of location look like Facebook's understanding of location. But there's also moments when there's a separation, where there's a pulling away, when news organizations are trying not to look like technology companies. Example. The Washington Post was punished uh, for briefly, but very notably, uh, inserting sponsored links to Amazon content within its books and movie reviews. Um, that was not cool, also considering who owns um, the Washington Post. Jeff Bezos. Um, <laughs> AP, the Associated Press, briefly used its own Twitter handle to publish, quote, sponsored tweets, blending the reporting of news with the sponsorship of messages. Twitter was okay with this, Google was not, and actually refused to index that content. So we saw a clash in how the tech companies dealt with that. Finally, when footage of Virginia journalists being shot on air played with sound, auto-played with sound, as people scrolled through their Facebook and Twitter feeds, news organizations complained loudly and said this generic user experience design, this platform auto-playing content, um, cannot work for all news. It was a genre separation, experience separation. So these fights over resemblances, I want to argue, and I argue in the book, are fights about getting right, getting quote right, the separations and dependencies of networked press infrastructure. These are fights about press freedom. The book tries to put these stories in context. It shows how seemingly idiosyncratic incidents are evidence of larger challenges to press freedom and how such freedom spans humans and machines that together create publics. So my hope is that readers take away from the book two things, a skepticism about the idea of press freedom, looking at it in historical context, but also an excitement about the promise of press freedom as a tool for thinking about what public life can mean. So if somebody says, quote, we need a free press, my hope is that the book nudges you to ask what kind of freedom what kind of press, and for what kind of public. Thanks. What do you think? Close enough. Yeah, it's good. All right, thanks to Data Society also for the invitation, and thank you for indulging uh, book writers 
labor over our words for a long time. And it's a really cool opportunity to just read the words instead of just summarize. So um, it's a real treat. I'll try not to do too much. This is from uh, the concluding chapter of the book, uh, which is called What Platforms Are and What They Should Be. Content moderation is such a complex social technical under undertaking that all things considered, it's amazing that it works at all and as well as it does. Even so, as a society, we have once again handed over to private companies the power to set and enforce the boundaries of appropriate public speech for us. That's enormous cultural power held by a few deeply invested stakeholders, and it's being done behind closed doors, making it difficult for anyone else to inspect or challenge. Platforms frequently and conspicuously fail to live up to our expectations. In fact, given the sheer enormity of the undertaking, most platforms' definition of success includes failing users on a regular basis. We must recognize that moderation is hard work, that we're asking platforms to intervene, and that they have responded by enlisting us in the labor. What's important then is that we understand the ways in which platforms are moderated, by whom and to what ends. But more than that, the discussion about content moderation needs to shift away from a focus on the harms users face and the missteps platforms sometimes make in response to a more expansive examination of the responsibilities of platforms that moves beyond their legal liability to consider their greater obligations to the public. Perhaps we're now experiencing the long hangover after the ebullient high of Web 2.0, the birth of social media, and the rise of a global commercial advertising supported internet culture. The bursting of a cultural bubble, if not a financial one. The dreams of the open web did not fail exactly, nor were they empty promises to begin with. Many people put in a great deal of effort, time, resources, and dollars to pursue these dreams and to build infrastructures to support them. But when you build a system that aspires to make possible a certain kind of social activity, even if envisioned in the most positive terms, you also make possible its inverse, activity that adopts the same shape in order to accomplish the opposite end. In embracing the internet, the web, and especially social media platforms for public discourse and sociality, we made a Faustian bargain, or a series of them, and we're now facing the sober realities they produced. If we dreamed of free information, we found we also got free advertising. If we dreamed of participation, we also got harassment. If we dreamed of sharing, we also got piracy. If we dreamed of political activism online, we also got clicktivism, political pandering, and tweet storms. If we dreamed of forming global decentralized communities of interest, we also got ISIS recruitment. If we dreamed of new forms of public visibility, we also got NSA surveillance. If we dreamed of free content and crowdsourced knowledge, we also got the exploitation of free labor. And if we dreamed of easy interconnection between complex technical resources, we also got hacked passwords, data breaches, and cyber war. The companies that have profited most from our commitment to platforms did so by selling the promises of participatory culture. As those promises have begun to sour and the reality of their impact on public life has become more obvious and more complicated, these companies are now grappling with how best to be stewards of public culture a responsibility that was not evident to them at the start. The debates about content moderation over the past decade can be read as social media's slow and bumpy maturation. It's gathering recognition that it is a powerful infrastructure for knowledge, participation, and public expression. The adjustments the platforms have already made have not sufficiently answered the now relentless scrutiny being paid to them by policymakers, the changing expectations articulated by the press, and the deep ambivalence now felt by users. Social media platforms have, in many ways, reached an untenable point. This does not mean they cannot function, clearly they can, but that the challenges they face are now so deep as to be paradoxical. Content moderation is a key part of what social media platforms do that is different, that distinguishes them from the open web. They moderate, they recommend, and they curate. Platforms use these three levers together to actively and dynamically tune the unexpected participation of users to produce the right feed for each user, the right social exchanges, the right kind of community. And here, right may mean ethical, legal, healthy. It also means whatever will promote engagement, increase ad revenue, and facilitate data collection. 
And given the immense pushback from users, legislators, and the press, these platforms appear to be deeply out of tune. So if, if content moderation is the commodity, if it is the essence of what platforms do, then it no longer makes sense to treat it as a bandage to be applied or a mess to be swept up. Too often, social media platforms treat content moderation as a problem to be solved and solved privately and reactively. Platform managers understand their responsibility primarily as protecting users from the offense and harm they are experiencing. But now, platforms th find they must answer also to users who find themselves troubled by and implicated in a system that facilitates the reprehensible, even if they never see it. Removing content is no longer enough. The offense and harm in question is not just to individuals, but to the public itself and to the institutions on which it depends. This is, according to John Dewey, the very nature of a public. It's a quote. The public consists of all those who are affected by the indirect consequences of transactions to such an extent that it is deemed necessary to have those consequences systematically cared for. In other words, what makes something of concern to the public is the potential need for its inhibition. Despite the safe harbor provided by the law and the indemnity enshrined in their terms of service contracts as private actors, social media platforms inhabit a position of responsibility, not only to individual users, but to the public they powerfully affect. When an intermediary grows this large, this entwined with the institutions of public discourse, this crucial, it has an implicit contract with the public that whether platform management likes it or not can differ from the contract it required us to click through. The primary and secondary effects these platforms have on essential aspects of public life as they become apparent now lie at their doorstep. Rethinking content moderation might begin with this recognition, that content moderation is the essential offer platforms make and part of how they tune the public discourse they purport to host. Platforms could be held, res held responsible, at least partially, for how they tend to that part public discourse and to what ends. The easy version of such an obligation would be to require platforms to moderate more, or more quickly, or more aggressively, or more thoughtfully. We've already begun to see public and legal calls for such changes. But I'm suggesting something else, that their shared responsibility for the public requires that they share that responsibility with the public, and not just the labor, but the judgment. Thanks. to start off with kind of the recent allegations of conservative bias against platforms that are being leveled by um, kind of politics and from, that are stemming from the content moderation that um, platforms are being urged to do. And then how those kind of run into um, some of the uh, requests for press freedom and the idea that there should be uh, an openness for the press on these platforms, and um, a person whose name I won't say, but it remind, rhymes with Schmalik's bones, <laughs> is uh, is yeah, I know. Uh, you know is you know is banned, and although not a journalist, uh, you know certainly made a claim to be one, and kind of triggered a uh, a question for a lot of people about the role that the platforms are going to play as gatekeepers. And I think, I, I imagine that you both have things that you think the platforms can learn from the press or the press can learn from the platforms. And so I kick that to both of you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I can start. I have a lot of thoughts about the conservative bias argument and the Schmalik Schmones <laughs> argument. Um, but I'll start with, so I, I think we're at a really um, precarious moment. I think there are a lot of people in our field uh, people that we depend on in our scholarship, um, people who are in the room, uh, who have been thinking about content moderation as just one piece of it, um, the, all the ways in which platforms may be shaping, subtly or otherwise, the flow of information, the privileging of information, who participates, what we encounter, what we don't encounter. Um, in the book, I use moderation as like one lens to kind of shoot through that question, but it's a piece of a puzzle that you know, algorithmic bias is another piece of that puzzle, commitment to advertising is another piece of that puzzle, um, 
Uh, and so the questions about how these platforms are and have been designed, how they institute policies, how their economics press them to do certain kinds of things, are reasonably raising a set of questions about their impact. And um, for a long time, the answer to that concern about impact was, um, no, we don't have that impact, right? Uh, and even as most, uh, even as recent as 2016, when people began to really raise questions about fake news and Russian bots, Mark Zuckerberg says that said that was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And a month later, he said that wasn't ridiculous. Um, so for years, people have been asking this question um, and, and saying, you know, maybe there are subtle ways that these things are not mere conduits, that they shape and structure and amplify. Right? Um, it seems like because of external events, because of the development of that debate, because of some um, really talented people kind of pushing on that question, um, the notion that they are not mere conduits, that they structure in all sorts of ways, that they amplify and aggravate, is becoming an open question. And there are a lot of ways to ask that question and a lot of kind of subtle effects that it might have. Right at that moment, I think we heard uh, a, a big expansion of the, I bet this is blocking conservatives. Mm -hmm. And um, what was worrisome to me was not just that I thought that that misunderstood kind of a much more structural concern, um, and I think misunderstood how these platforms work in a kind of fundamental way, but that it was gonna take the opportunity of that sense that there is something amiss, and the opportunity of like the stone was beginning to roll and fit it with a much, either a much simpler analysis or a, if you're gonna ask those questions about bias and complexity, you better also ask our questions. Um, and that connects to the questions of how um, it's not only uh, people making the critique of platforms as being conservatively biased as a way of kind of scoring points and taking advantage of that beginning of a conversation, but also people who are tactically using the platforms themselves, um, sometimes by saying compelling things and being circulated, but what we're concerned about is performing in a way that the platforms know how to pick up and circulate and performing in a way that they know that the moderation response will react to it and then that itself can be made an issue. Um, I think that complicates things because I think we don't actually know the really subtle and sort of multi-layered ways in which these systems shift discourse and amplify. I think we don't even have a language for the kind of like multiple loops of feedback mm -hmm. that a dynamic system and a dynamic cultural producers mm -hmm. and a dynamic policies that they're all listening to each other and are constantly being attuned at a pace that we've never dealt with and for a population the scale of which we've never dealt with. So it's a crucial time to ask that question and there's a, like a moment where we're sort of balancing on how well we ask that question. And I feel like the next year or two, because of the way the question, not, not being hijacked, but is being grabbed uh, for political value, I think is really dangerous, yeah. Cool, yeah. Okay, we'll see. Um, yeah, no, I agree with what Charlton said in terms of the the moment, and and you said this is a really particular historical moment to ask the questions. I guess the the things that have come up for me in thinking about the these ideas that I've been sort of having for for years, and that sort of manifest in the book, and, and these historical moments that come up with schmalic bones, <laughs> people like that, is a few questions come to mind. I mean, one uh, in that example in particular, but I think it's a broader one as well, is sort of this question of where is the speech? When we, when we talk about speech appearing or speech being banned or speech being promoted, this is a moment when the press as sort of a distributed thing um, starts to look really complicated and really messy. So we can ask whether the speech is happening on a Radio Collins show. We can have, is the speech happening um, on a platform like Twitter or Facebook? Is it happening within an app that's in the Apple Store or Google Store? Um, is the speech happening in the pages of The Guardian or The New York Times or The Washington Post and being contextualized within that space? Um, when we talk about what a ban is, it to me sort of says, well, okay, we, we need to talk about the different locations that speech can be in any given moment. And what it then sort of makes me think about, and I write, I write a little bit about this in the book, is that I think what we're talking about now um, are sort of probabilistic speech systems as well. So 
bands are not things that are binary, right? It's not, you know, and when you were able to control attention in a particular way, I think you could make a stronger claim to saying something has been banned or not. I think we're now sort of in more of a probabilistic space where we're saying, well, there's a, a less of a likelihood of speech that is like that speech circulating in spaces that you may encounter. Like you start to add these sort of qualifiers and qualifiers, and it becomes really hard to talk about even what the meaning of a ban is. Um, so that that for me was sort of um, one takeaway. And it and then the, the last thing I'll say on that is it was also sort of a moment of really seeing these differences or sort of intersections between. Uh, content moderation, platform judgments, and news judgments, editorial judgments. So I, I don't know of you know, serious arguments that said no journalist should cover the existence of this case and that we should ban the appearance of this, that person and that topic from the pages. There was no editorial. That was, this was newsworthy. This was, this was sort of a self-evident thing to say it's newsworthy. Um, but the platforms, at least to, to my read, didn't have a similar um, sort of response. There wasn't this sort of thing of saying, well, you know, let's maybe contextualize it in a way. I mean, I know Facebook has done that for a, a few kinds of content where they sort of, you know, place borders around it and try to contextualize information. But for this case, it seemed like a binary response. Whereas in, in newsrooms, I think it's a much, it's, it's a sort of a different, complicated, perhaps more historically nuanced uh, conversation about whether a person or speech gets to appear um, in news organizations. Anyway, so those are the things that came up for me. Yeah, so that's that's a really great point, and I think that I'm going to pull out something. So one of the things that kind of that uh, you're both you've both used the word am amplification, and um, and Dana just Dana Boyd just spoke about this um, at ONA, and um, Whitney Phillips uh, has spoke about um, kind of the oxygen oxygenation of amplification um, argument. Um, but the press and platforms are two of the main ways that we have used to amplify speech. And for most of history, it was just the press. And now we have this democratization of that through platforms. Um, and both of them have this interesting amount of immunity around them, so uh, legally speaking. So the press has First Amendment immunity, really. It's a special category of protection in, like, within the First Amendment. And platforms have Section 230 immunity. But if amplification is where the conversation is and controlling amplification is part of the conversation, how do we reflect that? Do we reflect it in, the, in changes to kind of a legal structure? Do we expect it to be reflected in kind of a more normative conversation and changes that way? Yeah, I, before we touch on the legal thing, I was thinking about, so, so the, the distinction that we often have between people who make speech and people who distribute speech is only clean by convention. Um, and so the feeling that, um, but, it, but it offers a defense. So there's the defense that the platforms enjoy, which is the Section 230 liability protection. So they won't be held legally liable for most of what their users do. Um, that's a part of how the platforms have a kind of legitimacy for the choices they make or defense for the choices they make. Another defense is that um, we just pass things through, the kind of like pure conduit argument. And oftentimes we feel like now we're in a kind of like, oh, we have to think about platforms. Platforms play this weird role we've never had before. But I think one way to alter that thought is to say um, there have always been other things that were like platforms. We just uh, often don't look at their influence because they've so successfully presented themselves as conduits. And I'm thinking about, um, I don't know the dates. I should have looked this up beforehand, but it just occurred to me. So how would I do that? Um, the 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 efforts to shut down Larry Flint and Hustler Magazine mm. were focused on magazine sellers, mm -hmm. right? So if you were a shop, mm -hmm. you could be brought out for indecency because you were selling the magazine, which was different than saying the magazine can't be published. There were also efforts to do that, mm -hmm. but it was an attempt to say we're going to go after the place that is helping this thing get out there, right? Maybe because you think that's responsibility, maybe that's convenience, because that's where you can make a difference. Um, maybe you can scare magazine sellers into not carrying it because they don't want to take the, the legal risk. That sounds kind of familiar, right? Now, we could even think about what do magazine sellers do that subtly, you know, they make choices. They don't carry certain things. They put things in the front of the, the store and other things in the back, things face forward, things, you know, these are very kind of like basic ways in which their selection process, their economics, they're you know, needing to sustain themselves as a business 
is a part, right? And where you get the news, whether it's in a, you know, a box on the corner or a newsy or online or in the library, these are all distribution systems that hide themselves as mere distribution systems. Um, but and I think you get to this point in the book, like if we think about kind of the mat social and material infrastructure of the press, it's more than just the reporter with the card in the hat going and fetching the story. It's a lot, and it's always had to do with that infrastructure. Um, the legal part of it is, is one of those assurances that then says, yes, as you internet service providers, search engines, and then platforms are enjoying your growth and you're clearly building on a system that is unpredictable user behavior, we don't want you to get sued out of existence because someone said something terrible, mm -hmm. which then granted a whole other protection that not only gr gave platforms enormous safety from any of these concerns, but then built on top of those notions. You're a mere conduit, you distribute information, that's an unqualified good, and we're gonna protect you from any legal risk in doing so. Um, so we have to think about these layers of protection that hide the way that all of these things are connected. The content makers, whether it's a journalist or a user producer or Schmalik Schmoens, and then the mechanisms by which those things travel to a reader or a public and are adjusted along the way. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, um, I could that, but also say, I guess the, the places where I would look for that to try to understand that phenomenon, um, partly it's in sort of the, the cultures and the practices of the news organizations, which have been doing that kind of decisions about whether to amplify or not for a really long time. So I'm thinking, you know, there's, there's old work, I think that uh, Robert Darton is a you know, historian of, of the press, and when I, it was a great interview study where he did, we would talk to journalists and say, well, you know, isn't it an amazing job to write for the public and you're getting to amplify all these voices and you're getting to sort of, you know, have this kind of role where you're writing for the public. And he kept sort of saying over and over again, writing for the public. And the overwhelming response he would get from journalists is say, no way am I writing for the public. That is a large, scary, amorphous, sort of ill-formed thing. I write for my family. I write for my friends. I write for my editor. I write for all of these people that I can imagine as my audience, as my readers, and there was a kind of um, sort of implicit or emergent, um, I mean, so the word self-censorship might be too strong a word to, to use for that, but it was definitely an imagined audience that the result of which was to say some things got covered and some things didn't get covered. And that's, I, I think that appears in sort of a lot of uh, communities of practice. And, and some other work I've looked at sort of, um, this idea of when, so calling, calling the, the, the white space press, or moments when absence, when silence happens in the press. And there's lots of moments when journalists will choose not to cover something, either explicitly, because it's not consistent with, they'll usually make a judgment about the newsworthiness of something. That's, that's one of the most, if you're ever sort of interviewing or talk to journalists and they say whether something's newsworthy or not, that's a fabulous opening, right? Because you can just say, what the heck do you mean by newsworthy? But that's, there's that, but that's a very, to your point, that's a very stable uh, trope of the practice is to talk about whether something's newsworthy or not. And I, I, my read of platforms is we're not necessarily there yet to have the stability of those tropes. We're sort of figuring them out right now. Um, maybe, you know, objectivity is something that gets thrown away by, by platform makers sometimes. Or community or, community or yeah. Those okay, well that's actually, that's actually a perfect segue to like my next question, which is I think that, well, you both mentioned the public. Publics, public, <clears throat> and Charlton, you spoke about making the right decision, and now you've just kind of mentioned this idea of what the community is and making the right decision for communities. And um, so I'm actually, I'm writing a paper about the, like how the platforms have been developing the newsworthy standard within their, within policing their, um, their boundaries of content moderation. So um, I'm super interested in this question of who the we is. Who is the we? Who is this community that we're making all of these right decisions for? Um, because, you know, a perfect example in the content moderation world is, you know, that Facebook decided that they didn't want um, women's breasts on Facebook, and so pictures of women's breasts came down. And, f like, France was th thought that that was abhorrent. And India, meanwhile, thinks that you shouldn't have pictures up of people open mouth kissing. And so they thought that this decision to even keep, you know, to even have a, a discussion about whether or not someone's shoulders were showing was was bad, and Facebook said, no, this is gonna be the standard that we set, right? This is gonna be um, what we do, and I guess the joke that they used to say was kind of like, if you, you know, you know you're doing the right thing if nobody's happy with you, right? So, um, I'm, 
I'm increasingly intrigued how this doesn't end up in kind of a balkanization of the internet, how this doesn't end up in kind of little fiefdoms in which we're making these decisions and we're kind of splitting things into different cultures and norms and how we keep that from getting incredibly fine grained. I know that we've all been in conversations at various things where this has come up. I, so I'm just curious how you guys are feeling about this right now. Wait, I, I'm building off of Mike's point about the way newsworthy and your question of like, what are those words? Um, where have those emerged? It's really interesting to talk to people at the major platforms who do content moderation. In their more honest moments, they will say something like, it's impossible to be right, given the scale. Um, and it may be impossible to be just, but you can try to be consistent. Consistency cons is the only yeah. thing they really care oh, about. They love that, they love that. And it, it's, it's like the closest proxy they can get for, for being right or just, right? If you're consistent, as long as like, and we're making these you know, hundreds and thousands of decisions every day, as long as like your bad thing was as bad as your bad thing and the decision, the same decision you know, happened, which again, it's like in dynamic systems being managed by 10,000 people, right? It's, it's astounding to believe that you could be consistent or that you'd want, I mean, one thing we like about these systems is that they learn, right? So if they learn, then they shouldn't be consistent because they should change all the time. And we know that cultural practices change all the time and vary immensely in the ways, in many ways, including the ones you pointed out. So consistency is hilarious, right, or tragic, um, but, but we can understand where it comes from, right? It, a, a kind of like notion of fairness in the courts, right? That like, we don't really know what the right answer is, but we at least want to feel like if we got there, we got the same judgment criteria that our next citizen did. Um, I think we've been in a period where that notion of consistency, we know that the platforms, when faced with French values and Indian values don't look the same, they say, we want one rule across. We don't want a Facebook for France and a Facebook for India and a Facebook for every other place for all sorts of reasons, um, not unreasonable reasons, but the, the alternative is a universal standard across all. Now, the more you dig, the more you know that like, in fact, many of these decisions are made in a more ad hoc way. So it depends on uh, who they're talking to, it depends on the person's access. Robin Kaplan and I have been looking into YouTube's relationships to their, that the way that someone who has 15 million subscribers and gets their video taken down, the access they have or the, you know, the point of contact is gonna be very different than someone who got flagged and got looked at for 10 seconds and is just a, you know, a typical user in that framework. So, so the reality of kind of the ad hoc, the variety of ad hoc dynamics mm -hmm. and the impulse to be consistent as a way to manage scale and financial you know, implications that do stratify and give people special access. Uh, maybe we're gonna see a moment where that, that notion of consistency on a global scale, on an all the time as a defensive is gonna break down in certain ways. Um, but that's one of those impulses that kind of uh, coheres in the practices, helps people understand the way newsworthy or community um, kind of does the work of saying, we think we know what makes sense here. The other thing I'd add to that is that um, maybe I, I think one of the other sort of categories or stable sort of logics, uh, in addition to this idea of consistency, um, is also sort of the nation state as one of the containers of the public and sort of this conflation or this uh, sort of using those terms interchangeably of saying, well, you know, France wants this or India wants this and sort of mm -hmm. going to the legal or regulatory regimes of those nations and sort of reading those for different um, uh, different meanings of what it should be, and I would, I, you know, if if I if I had you know a bunch of senior platform people in a room, and I would really want to say, you know, let's spend a little bit of time, maybe an afternoon, with some political theory and talk about how there's lots of different kinds of publics, and there's increasingly notions of publicness that are transnational, and that we don't actually have to stick to sort of national jurisdictions. One of the things publics or uh, platforms might be able to do is actually make some really creative, interesting, powerful interventions that cut across um, different kinds of public arrangements. So there's, you know, I mean, th there's old example, you mentioned the Adewian, you know, consequentialist public, you know, sort of born of American pragmatism and thinking about shared consequences, but there's lots of other kinds of publics. You can, you can go to a Habermasian public if you really want to. It's not my favorite place, not my favorite place to hang out, but this idea of rationalized, you know, uh, discourse where we all check our identities at the door, but that is a version of a public that's there. Um, there's an, I'm thinking of Catherine Squires has a really nice notion of an enclave public where she 
does a lot of nice historical work looking at the Underground Railroad uh, in this country and how basically there's a need for different kinds of social groups to actually have protection from visibility and the ability to sort of cohere and as a group because they're under threats from harms. Uh, Chris Kelty's notion of a recursive public is just the power to constitute yourself as a public is another way to think about it. So I, I, when I think about these kinds of things, I, my hope or my dream would be that we can actually draw upon and connect to a lot of rich thinking that I think has been done about associational life such that we can move past tropes of community. And, and, and if we can get past community, um, that would be lovely. That would be lovely. Yeah, I'm a loner. <laughs> okay, I think we're gonna take some questions. You guys will oh, I <laughs> Any questions? Hi, I'm Sean Sprecher. Thank you so much for um, the conversation. In terms of the decision-making process of moderation or amplification or the veracity of this information that these platforms are making, you talked about the stewardship that they have to do that and how that can look. What, um, besides them doing it themselves, who else do you see as the arbiter of kind of helping make those decisions? Besides, government and regulation is an obvious answer in some form, but besides just government, and the, what, what do you see is the appetite for those platforms and the leaders there to be more open to that at this point because it releases some of the obligation for them. To, and there's a famous, I think Microsoft at one point, welcomed by, um, regulations so they didn't have to make that decision. Um, so. Yeah, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna try out an idea that sounds hopelessly naive, so. I'll just caveat it right there. Um, but I think, you're, I think you're right, There's, there is probably an appetite now, um, and we've seen it even in the way that some of the people who have been called in front of Congress are talking, where regulation of a certain form might be welcome, as opposed to before when regulation was like the last thing they wanted. Um, so I, I'm, I'm increasingly struck by the idea that no matter how many times we tweak content moderation as it is, the, the idea that platforms doing it on our behalf is, is the wall we've hit, it's the problem that we've hit. And it has to do with that question of like, who, who do they imagine they're doing it for? Um, but the impossibility of who you do it for when it's at this scale and this range and this variety. So part of me feels like some of that work has to be handed back to users. This is the naive part. So um, when we start to imagine like, oh, what would that look like? We're all gonna like vote on each other's images and like let's, you know, let's all get together and decide the policy ourselves. It starts to sound really pie in the sky. I think there's a reason why it sounds pie in the sky, which is that for the last 10 years, social media platforms have innovated in one half of the promise of the web, that promise of everyone can speak, you won't have to be an expert, you don't need HTML, you can post, you can share, you can link. All the things that like the web was promising, you're gonna be an author, they really did spend 10 years innovating that half. The other half of the promise of the web was you can build your own community and run it in the way you see fit, the recursive public idea. And the platforms have not built for 10 years. So now I have to propose something that's like standing on 10 years of no support and no details versus the thing that's like deeply fleshed out, the current content moderation model. So what would it have looked like if for 10 years the platforms had looked for ways to um, in, in lean ways share that process, in innovative ways to let people form publics and share the decision making and be stewards of that process, right? Let some of that live on the platform and a commitment to transparency and doing it fairly and maybe a bottom level that says certain things are just off limits anyway, no matter what a group decides. Um, that, that I think, w until we do that and that either, I don't know how that happens, right? Maybe that's what regulation sort of could push because that's a question of like, well, what does the public need in this regard? Um, that to me is the, I don't know where the political will or the platform will to do it, but I think it should happen, comes from. I know, I th I'll just, um, I think that that's right. There is, there has been a sea change. I would call it, I would even say that it's not just about the, the platforms figuring out that they, that they could maybe accept some regulation. I think that there has been a huge change in, um, from 2008, kind of when they first started to develop 
at Facebook, for instance, like the really robust kind of new content moderation policy, there's just been a change where that was 100 million users at that point. And if they got a decision wrong, it didn't affect their product. That wasn't part of their product. It was such a small, tiny slice of like a wrong content moderation decision on one random person's um, platform just didn't make that big a deal. But at the size that they're at now, it's a huge part of their product. It's a huge part of their reputation and their relevance. And it's just become a um, it's just become a global issue. I think they'll all kind of, I don't know if you've heard this, but like the the napalm girl, the terror of war photo, that was like a sea change moment for these public for the, for these platforms. That was the moment that they realized that they that this was really a hundred percent part of their platform and their product to kind of work on this. So I think that there's also just been a norm shift in people becoming aware that this is happening. I mean, Tarleton, I'm sure we started kind of working on this at the same time. I used to tell people that I wor was working in content moderation and people were like, what? What in the what? I'm like, you know, they take down things that you post up and they're like, what, they do? Like, <laughs> you know, no one had any idea that this was going on. Um, and they were like, that's fascinating. I didn't know that was going on, um, but yeah, so. I think that there's just been a change in the public awareness, and there's just, there's parts of this is like, you just can't force it. Jeff Rosen wrote about this in 2011 and 2012 in the New York Times Magazine and Wired, not nothing publications, right? Like he was writing about content moderation and no one really had the wherewithal at that point to kind of grok it, you know? And so it just didn't take. So I wonder what that's about. I've always wondered that, so, sorry. No. <laughs> I would, the last thing I would say is that um, the, the question of, there were always people who were noticing it, but it was always these small communities, right? So the the mothers who were protesting about Facebook removing breastfeeding photos was starting in 2007, but it was a tiny little conversation that was internal to it, and it was hard for them to get press coverage. And it feels very clearly like this, both the ability for a group to say something has happened, but also these kind of incidents that raise the structural concern on a public level. And there's been a lot of good journalism that's helped do that as well. So it does seem like the, the ethos has changed. I don't know how else to name it. Can, can, yeah, I, don't, I want to get more questions, but just one point, especially on the, the Nick Ut moment. Um, I, I, I could be wrong in this, but one of the reactions was to say, well, let's have this small council within Facebook that's going to actually, um, you know, arbiter or be arbiters of this particular moment. To me, that, that was the, that's not the best governance move. That's not the most sort of um, expansive or creative way to think about that problem. And I come back to, again, sort of moments in journalism. The press has thought for a very long time about the relationships to its audiences and what kinds of organizational and institutional forms does the press engage with. So for a long time there were, you know, ombudsmen, they're mostly men, ombudsmen, um, public editors as well, but um, we saw some high profile examples of pu public editors actually being done away with and sort of news organizations saying, no, no, that accountability mechanism is happening elsewhere. It's happening on the very platforms, this was part of the New York Times' rationale for getting rid of its public editor, was to say, we can do that accountability elsewhere. We don't necessarily need that public editor position. So in the same sense, I think there are sort of interesting governance models. I, you know, why doesn't Facebook or Twitter sort of do a public editor-like kind of role? Um, make it look different. Make it look to its particular platform. Don't reinvent what news organizations have done. I haven't seen that organizational structure um, exist, but it could be. One, one more question. Uh, so I, I was fascinated by the idea of the public and creating the public. And I just read Jer Jeremy uh, Corbyn's uh, Labor Party lecture on how media should be reformed in the UK. So it seemed to me, and I wanted you to comment on this kind of gulf between American ways of looking at this and British ways of looking at this as seen through the Labor Party because uh, it seems to me in a wholesale way to address the comments that you're making. What was your, what was your sense of how he was imagining? What was his take? I don't think I read that. Well, it's, it really comes out of the Media Reform Coalition and it's, uh, I guess, imagining what public media would be like in a, in a digital era, nationalizing, uh, prohibiting foreign ownership, kind of radical, socialist views of what should happen to the media. But it seems to be getting traction, and it seems to be gathering a kind of institutional support. Uh, yeah, I don't, I didn't track Corbyn's comments on that in particular, so it's, it's hard for me to talk about that. I think, um, you know, the 
public media contexts in the U.S. and the U.K. are are pretty radically different. I would I would look to you know Victor Picard's work maybe um, on that kind of question um, about those reform movements. I, I think there are a few things maybe that could be done in the U.S. I'm thinking um, so some work I did with uh, Daniel Christ at um, UNC Chapel Hill a little while ago. We were playing and it was it was in the role of uh, or in the realm of naive ideas perhaps. We were sort of saying um, if news organizations put their content uh, into the public domain, maybe they should get rewarded for doing that with some kind of public subsidy for doing it. So, so if, you, if you released everything you did under Creative Commons, then maybe you've made some sort of public commitment, um, but you've still done it. It's not a state-funded media organization the same way, in the way that Americans often seem allergic to. It's still grounded in sort of this, um, uh, this idea of, of how ideas might be supported, but that was one thought. I, I don't know. I honestly, I'm sorry. I don't have a great answer for you. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if I, I if I we didn't catch what you're asking. Come back to it. But the it has been interesting to see the shift in European legislation around content moderation, right? So um, whether it's the EU, whether it's Germany, whether it's the UK, there have been a real strong push, uh, and there are people in the room who know this even better than I do. So I'm just going to rough it, but. Um, they seem to be taking a step forward to imagine what kind of what European obligations to a platform would be, whether that's right to be forgotten or being very rapid in response on terrorist content or hate speech. Um, and, and I think like maybe until we started seeing Jack Dorsey in front of Congress and Mark Zuckerberg, the sense was, oh, the Europeans are going to be way ahead of this because there's no political will in the U.S. to kind of push this hard. And they were pushing for criteria. I, I'm a little worried because they're doing it segment by segment. So it's kind of like, let's make terrorism a special category. Let's make hate speech a special category. Um, and maybe that's good because it kind of like pushes on this, you know, the tip of the spear, the thing that's most compelling. Or is that a bad idea because those things are actually quite different and they need to be thought about differently? Um, but it does feel like some notions that are animated by European sovereignty and European notions of public responsibility are driving the platforms. And it comes back to that question about whether the platforms are then going to respond in a way where they just make like European specific changes or whether they're going to change their practice entirely. We've seen with the data rules, most of the companies are saying, fine, we're just going to change everything we do because we can't tell when we have a European user and when we have a non-European user. I don't know if that will happen for the content moderation questions or not. So I'm just going to go ahead and wrap up, but I want to thank both of you for an amazing session, and this was really interesting. So. But I also just wanted to say that I think that um, I think that both of you kind of are just in this fascinating dialogue about what how we're going to define what the public is in the in the future and how we're going to define the intermediaries that kind of communicate and have responsibilities to that public. And I just I'm excited that you guys are out there doing that and talking about it. Yeah, we're, we're going to be here, so hang out if you have questions. If you get to them, we're here.